We have ourselves a beautiful and time-tested tradition down here in the United States. Something goes wrong, find somebody who ain't white and blame them for it. In recent days, due to the rise of COVID-19 in China, them Asians are getting the blame in the streets. A woman who's Asian says she was punched by another woman in midtown Manhattan, and she accused her of having the COVID-19 virus. Of course, Asian people, like all humans, are actually pretty badass. Want proof? Get it tonight. We take a look at some amazing Asians on Deep Fat Fried. Deep Fat Fried! I call them Amazians. Amazians! Oh, Oh, clever. Clever, dude. This one's this one ended up being kind of interesting uh, because there's a lot of Asian labor leaders. Um, you know, yeah, you I guess you wouldn't know that uh, growing up uh, and going to public school. You learn. They don't teach you about labor leaders. Period. In fucking sure. public schools, what I fucking for much. Yeah, I, I remember my because every time you fucking have done an episode where like you talk about like labor leaders of the past and the stuff they accomplished, I'm always like, huh, never heard of them. Oh, huh. dude. Never heard of taking for enterprise and civics and stuff. And it was just like, now let's talk about capitalism. And it's like, what about other systems of government? Oh, yeah, there's a thing called uh, socialism. I mean, uh, let me tell you uh, about George Washington. He chopped down the cherry tree. But then when his daddy came home, he said, George, did you chop down the cherry tree? Yeah. Um, So. Uh, and by the way, uh, preemptive apologies for horrible pronunciations of Asian names and or laughing at Asian names in this. I can't help it. And neither can uh, anybody here. Yep. Um, We're all immature neckbeard idiots. So, so this is speak for yourself. <laughs> I will not laugh but once. All right, cool. Uh, this is Sue Ko Lee, actually the baby here, born in Honolulu, Hawaii in 1910. Uh, she grew up uh, the oldest of 10 children. In Watsonville, California. When she was 18, she married <clears throat> Lee Ju Hing, an immigrant from China. <laughs> Lee Ju Hing? His middle name is Ju? Is, is Ju? Okay. His middle name is Ju. Well, All I right. mean, his proper name is Lee Ju Hing, so it's probably one name. I don't know, TJ. I don't know how is it works. It? How do Asian names work? I need a diagram. That was, okay. That's why right. I preemptively apologize. Yeah, we don't know. Because there's a lot of Asian <laughs> names in this. Uh, he was also an immigrant from uh, from China. What well, if actually, his name was he, like... She wasn't an immigrant from China. She he was. Um, uh, but he worked as a bookkeeper for natu- uh, national dollar stores. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lee took a job at the same factory along with several of her family members. Most Chinese workers in San Francisco uh, worked for Chinese employers like Zhou Shung. Uh, the owner of national dollar stores. Uh, they were okay. they often made low wages, as you can imagine. Worked in poor conditions, essentially sweatshop conditions. Uh, but their options were limited. Most white-owned businesses refused to hire them. In addition, because the Chinese immigrant community was so close-knit, many workers were connected to their bosses through family and through friendship ties. And uh, such personal relationships made workers reluctant to speak out against the poor treatment. Uh, And of course, keep in mind, there was a lot of anti-Asian sentiment at the time. Oh, the the Chinese exclusion act, dude. I mean, there was a ton of stuff going on in America, especially that part of the country. The Chinese exclusion act was, was that was in the eight, that was in the 1800s, right? Yep. Yeah. When did that, when did that kind of fall off the books? I I don't know that, but I'm sure I know that's not still in effect. So no, no, it's not. Well, we talk a little bit about it here. Uh, Chinese worker like Lee had a complicated relationship with the labor movement. Many unions had supported the Page Act in 1875 and the Chinese Exclusion Act we just talked about in 1882, which uh, restricted immigration from China. Sound familiar? Hmm. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's typical American bullshit. Yep. Just different fucking racial groups. I Um, mean, it says it here. Hip hooray. The white man is on top. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> look no further. White people have been terrified of being made minorities in what they see as their own country forever. 
um, while simultaneously benefiting from immigrant labor, of course. Uh, they had argued that Chinese laborers would undermine white workers' union gains by accepting lower wages and poor treatment. They often used racist imagery and lobbying for the laws, and this tension persisted into the 1900s. Chinese and Chinese-American workers were locked out of unionized factories by racist hiring practices. Um, they reasonably feared that their jobs would be taken by white workers if all the factories were unionized. But by the 1930s, uh, unions like the ILGWU were working hard to organize black, Latino, and uh, Asian-American workers. New Deal laws had established a minimum wage and legal protections for unionizing. So empowered unions wanted to expand their ranks. In uh, San Francisco, the ILGWU was concerned that Chinese-owned factories undercut white, uh, white-owned white union shops by charging lower prices for their work. Um, so this is just another example of how, like, excluding these people ended up biting laborers in the ass in the end. Oh, 100%. Right, because if you... If like when you saw the problem, because look, the problem is a legitimate problem when there's immigrants that come from, you know, foreign lands, whether it be China or anywhere else in the world where conditions are worse than they are here. Don't worry, that won't be for long because conditions here are deteriorating fast. But, you know, when they come from these other places, uh, they are willing to work for less. They are willing to accept shittier fucking conditions because, you know, comparatively to where they're from. Those conditions maybe but, aren't so bad. Yeah, but imagine if everyone like, <clears throat> but it was part of a union, then it wouldn't. Yeah, it, it wouldn't the, matter if the union solution had been like, we need to get these people, if they get these people out of here is a terrible solution because you're not going to do it. It's not even going to no, work. Let's get these people in here. Yeah, it's like <laughs> bring them into the fold. Let them know, hey, you're American now. You don't have to accept yeah, that like, shit. Th- exactly. Like, that's the fucked up thing. Is it basically they slit their own throats trying to like, say, oh, well, the way to exclude it is just if we exclude them. It's like, no, there's people are going to bring cheap labor here. It's this is basically it's, America's been built on cheap labor. It's literally it used to be <laughs> free labor. And, and then it was like, well, now it's not free. What's what's the minimum we can charge? I mean, basically. a rising tide raises all ships. And so yeah. it wasn't until the 30s that unions figured this out. Um, but uh, at least they did. Sue Ko Lee, uh, who we started talking about, started organizing the Chinese Ladies Garment Workers Union, local number uh, 361. Dope. And it won a union election in 1938. Uh, under the skilled lit- uh, leadership of ILGWU organizer Jenny Matias, a successful union election was won at the National Dollar Stores Factory for Better Wages in 1938. The owner... A prominent uh, Chinatown businessman promptly told the faci- uh, sold the facility to Golden Gate Manufacturing, a new company headed by the factory manager and another former National Dollar Store employee. So basically just like a shell company. Of course. Um, the change of ownership allowed management to set aside the hard won contract. <laughs> oh, man. Businesses are so scummy. Yep. It's like, all right, yeah, we, we agree. Oh, new ownership. This contract is yeah. You have, to, you have to negotiate with us, the new company now. Yeah. So seeing this move as an attempt to break their union, the workers went on strike, picketing the factory and its three retail stores in San Francisco for 15 weeks. Uh, during the struggle, Suko Lee and other women workers actively engaged in the strike, uh, walking the line, organizing picket shifts, and uh, speaking out publicly at meetings for the first time. Uh, when white retail clerks supported the strikers and refused to cross the line and shut down the picketed retail outlets for two weeks, the owner finally negotiated with the workers to settle a contract. <laughs> Even white people agree. Yeah. Oh, shit. It just goes to show oh, you no. like, solidarity. The white people are on their side. No, we have to deal with them. I mean, in the you know, like these white uh, workers at these stores and owner operators of these stores, they saw the writing on the wall. They they understood the principle that like if these people are kept in underclass, I'm pretty soon going to be joining them down there. They're going to be slashing my fucking wages and shit. So, yeah, I'm going to fucking back these people that are working in my store and shit. And that wasn't expected. And so at that point, after rebranding the company and hiding it behind a shell corporation, they finally were like, all right, fine. Yeah, fine. Fuck it. I guess we'll do it. Um. So. Uh, let's see when when the retail cur- uh, clerk supported the strikers like i said uh they they negotiated the contract at the time it was the longest strike in the history of san francisco's chinatown uh the workers won a five percent raise 
a 40-hour work week, enforcement of health, fire, and sanitary conditions, and a guarantee that Golden Gate Manufacturing would provide work for a minimum of 11 months of the year to its workers. Wow. Sounds like they had some insane demands. Yep. Oh, my God. They're insane. 40-hour they're- work week, enforcement of health, fire, oh. and sanitary conditions. Oh, my God. You mean if there's a fire in the building? What a nightmare. How am I supposed to make money with all these? People have to be able to get out of the and we saw, we've seen that in Bangladesh and these places now where they manufacture a bunch of textile shit. That's why they moved it overseas. Do you want to know the reason why? It's shit like this. It's like, oh, well, there's no regulations over there, so we can just do whatever we want because here they have to do if shit they like won't this. let us exploit them here, we'll exploit them over there and then well, yeah. move the shit here. 100% that's what that, that's why it's, I mean, well, I mean, think about it. For American businesses, I mean, like Nike and shit, most of shit is made in sweatshops because if True. they made it here, it would cost more money and consumers would go, I don't want to buy that. I don't want to pay that. Can you just start making a sweatshop overseas? Okay, we will. Thanks, guys. Maybe we should just like try to fucking cr- construct an economy that puts more money in the hands of the consumer so that higher prices aren't a big deal, but you know, whatever. Yep. That might be mm. one way to do it. Also, that sounds insane. The some- race to the bottom sounds better, TJ. Let's just grind people into dust. Let's oh, okay. do that. <laughs> I mean, fair enough. That works too, I guess. Um, So, uh, yeah, despite these protections, one year after winning the contract, Golden Gate conveniently went out of business. Uh, Uh, Too bad. The ease with which garment factories could close up shop, relocate and rebrand and all of that, sometimes leaving a substantial debt and unpaid wages, made it a common practice in the 30s. And this tactic remains a constant threat for workers attempting to organize a union, even to this day. Um, a lot of these things you you think about it. Oh man, back in the day, businesses were really scummy. They still do the same exact. Oh no, they're shit. the same now. Close oh, yeah. now. Oh yeah. Oh well, we can't afford to pay you, so we will sell the business to another company. Wink, wink. I still nudge, remember nudge. my. I still remember my dad coming to me and, and he was like talking all reverent about um, fucking Sam Walton, the dude who founded Walmart. And he's like, Yeah, one time this Walmart store somewhere tried to um unionized and sam walton went in there and just shut the whole thing down <laughs> you know i'm like oh that's nice i guess well a big thing that sam walton had was like, he was like well he was american suppliers which he did use more of but the minute he died it was like china <laughs> like, oh, china, no. china 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 um so even though this garment uh worker strike uh against this company was i guess unsuccessful because the business was able to defeat it by just closing down and reinvesting its operation in some other factory um it did raise the profile of asians in san francisco in the labor space to the point where it led to a a lot of uh it set precedent so their winning of a contract with a 40-hour work week and all these protections in it spread far beyond what they did at that factory and led to a you know a lot of the increases that went on um as the years went by for um uh, marginalized people in uh, San Francisco. So pretty cool. Um, here's another uh, amazing Asian labor leader. This is uh, Larry Dulay. It's long. It's Leong. It's Leong. And you can tell he's fucking badass just looking at him. Um, uh, I just want to know, Paul, could you tell me fucking cigar, dude? Can you tell me about the size of this dude's dick? Um, well, I'll tell you this. He had a nickname. <laughs> Which is, you know what I mean? Like, uh, cool already. His nickname was Seven Fingers. Yeah. That's so, pretty dope. <laughs> uh, he was a Filipino American labor organizer. He's been described as one of the fathers of the West Coast labor movement. He organized West Coast agricultural workers starting in the 30s, same kind of time period, attending his first strike uh, at just 15 years old. And the reason I'm covering some of this is because a lot of these conditions that these people are striking against are have come yeah. like a lot of the a lot of the uh, the things that they won at this we've time lost. we've lost and it's time to yeah. win oh, them again. A hundred percent. You can't keep the bastards down, can you? Nope. Uh, and here's how they did it. Uh, so it, he attended his first strike at 15 years old shortly after immigrating to America from the Philippines. So this is uh, an example of where it was done right by the labor movement, right? Here came an immigrant from the Philippines, and instead of being ostracized, the farm workers movement, which was made up of mostly immigrants anyway, was like, hey, fucking come on in. You're a comrade. You're an extra body on the line. You're an extra fucking person to be in the union. Um, So as a farm worker, he worked in Alaska, where he organized cannery and agricultural unions, uh, Washington and up and down California. 
Also worked in Montana and South Dakota. While he was living in Alaska, he helped found uh, the Alaska Cannery Workers Union, which later became local number seven of the United Cannery and Packing and Allied Workers Union, then local seven of the International Longshoremen's and Warehouse Workers Union. Uh, he lost three fingers in an accident at that cannery, which earned him his nickname, Seven Fingers. Uh, cool. Um, I mean, it's not cool he lost his fingers, I guess. But, I mean, you but know. it added character Pretty cool. to a cigar yeah, smoking. Fuck yeah, dude, that's seven fingers. Yeah. What happened? You gotta ask him. <laughs> you know what I mean, yeah. you didn't, you didn't, do, you didn't fucking, uh, you didn't do the pun, the pun I was trying to set you up for, Paul. Oh, uh, what was I that? Asked, when I asked how big his dick was. You were supposed to say, "Oh, <laughs> it Leong." You know what I mean? There you go. I was trying to avoid it, TJ. Okay, sorry. But you, you threw it in there. So there I wanted, you go. I wanted it in there real bad. Um, so the Filipino uh, Farm Labor Union was organized uh, in 1956 by Larry Itliong. <laughs> he rose to prominence uh, when he organized a strike against grape growers in uh, Delano, California, not far from where I'm at now. Uh, in 1965, as the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee to Fight Exploitation. They had previously organized a strike against grape growers that resulted in a wage of $1.40 an hour. But because they had to move with the season, they arrived in Delano and found that the farmers there were only willing to pay $1.20, which was below the federal minimum wage of $1.25 at the time. So they were just like, you know what? Fuck you. We're going to go just below the minimum wage for you immigrants. How up about here. that? So it's like every town they stopped in, they had to fight for like a, yeah. a, a semi-decent <laughs> wage. Um, on September 8th, 1965, in Leong and more than 1,000 Filipino farm workers walked off the vineyards and began their strike against the Delano table gra- uh, grape growers. In response to the strikers, grape growers hired Mexican farm workers to cross the picket lines and break the strike. This is a tactic typically used to create conflict and reinforce divisions between Filipino and Mexican farm workers. So oftentimes it's used to exploit two different immigrant communities by another tactic continuously used this day. Like with this uh, John Deere strike that's going on right now, as, as of the shooting of this episode, they hired a bunch of scabs and like there was almost immediately a fucking horrible <laughs> accident, uh, like where a tractor was crashed or something like that, or a forklift or something like that. Yeah. Um, because, you know, of course, the scabs don't know what they're fucking doing No. Um, so for eight days, they were harassed and they faced violence and they saw no progress uh, to prevent the strike from ending in failure. It Leong went to uh, Cesar Chavez, another guy who we might cover on the show someday. Uh, he was the leader of the newly established National Farm Workers Association. And uh, Chavez initially declined the request because he believed that the National Farm Workers Association was not financially stable enough to join the strike yet. However, uh, because the members expressed a desire to support the Filipinos, uh, Chavez decided to hold an emergency conference um, and allow the members to decide for themselves whether or not they would uh, give support to this strike effort. And a crowd of more than 1,200 supporters attended the meeting and overwhelmingly voted in favor of joining the strike. And... That's how it happened. So members of Chavez. I never know what to think about the human race. You know that? <clears throat> yeah, I know. You, 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 Sometimes I'm like, huh? Wow, they, we did the right thing there. Oh wait, there we did. We did, we did bad there. There's yeah. like this fucking good, guy bad. always has a fucking cigar in his mouth, dude. I feel like the bad usually outweighs the good. But Dude's- you know, there's there's nice stories like that. Bunch of people like, hey guys, I don't know if we're in the financial position to do this. It's like bullshit. We stand with our Filipino brothers. It's like okay. All right, fine, we'll do it. Hey, yeah. Shit, I guess we'll do it. Fuck, all right. So uh, they voted to join the strike, and the strike that they joined lasted for five years. And, oh, fuck. Uh, was characterized by its grassroots efforts, consumer boycotts, marches, community organizing, and nonviolent resistance, which gained the movement uh, national attention. There was also a 340-mile march from Delano to Sacramento in 1966. In July 1970, the strike resulted in a victory for farm workers due to a largely consumer boycott of non-union grapes uh, when a collective bargaining agreement was reached with major table grape uh, growers affecting more than 10,000 farm workers. This also brought these two unions together, uh, Cesar Chavez's and Ed Leong's, to form um, United Farm Workers, which still exists today. So pretty cool. 
little bit about Id Leong now because he's such an interesting cuts in, such an interesting figure. He's I think a, it's cool that they, that even consumers were uh, supportive enough of the strike that the grape union that the grape growers had to just be like, I all mean, right, at, fuck. at that point, I mean, facing a sustained strike and actually the consumers that uh, I mean, that's why, you know, the civil rights movement was I so know those consumers well. had to be paying more for those union grapes, too. So, of course, uh, but a lot of them had people working in the industry. You know what I mean? It was just, it was a grassroots effort that eventually won. But you saw how long it had to go on Five um, fucking years. So here's some just kind of like background on him. He was an excellent card player, as you can tell by just looking at him. Fucking bet. Uh, Avid cigar smoker, uh, of course. We haven't seen a picture of him yet that he wasn't chomping one. Uh, Spoke multiple Filipino languages, Spanish, Cantonese, Japanese. Taught himself about law, even though he only had about a sixth grade education. He got married six times and had seven kids. Raised his family in the Delano area in the Little Manila uh, community of Stockton, California. Um, after leaving the United Farm Workers, Ed Leong uh, assisted retired Filipino farm workers in Delano. He was a delegate at the 1972 Democratic National Convention. Uh, he worked towards building a recruitment facility for UFW workers known as the Agbayani Village. Although no longer the uh, in the United Farm Workers. He continued uh, to support others in the organized labor movement, Um, helped plan a number of strikes, Safeway strike in 1974. Um, He died in 1977 at 63 in Delano of Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, Most history books mention mention, uh, Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers, but really don't uh, have any mention of Larry Idleong or the Filipinos that joined the movement. And they were a huge part of and and remain uh, remain a huge part of the United Farm Workers. So sounds like it. (laughs) Yeah, it sounds like Chavez didn't even really want to do it at first. Yeah, uh, he was convinced by his leadership to do or his membership to do it. Um, So really interesting figure. You don't hear mentioned hardly ever anywhere, but uh, definitely an impactful labor leader. Let's take a little step away from later and uh, talk about some crazy shit that none of us understand. Let's talk about nuclear physics. Yeah. Uh, this is Dr. I get it. Uh, this is Dr. Xian uh, Xiong Wu. Uh, and she, she was forgot a, to carry the one. Look at that. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, right. Whatever. <laughs> See Amat- amateurish uh, work there on the board. I'm very disappointed. That's going to blow up right in your face. Um, so she was an American nuclear physicist, uh, physicist Chinese American, um, Xian Xiong Wu, known as the first lady of physics the queen of nuclear research and the Chinese Madame Curie. Fuck. Those are some pretty prestigious fucking yeah. nicknames. Queen of nuclear research and the first lady of physics in general. I mean, obviously just, she was just brilliant. I mean, just, the, I mean, just looking at the, I mean, just look at this picture. You can tell you a lot about a person. It's like that board to me is like, what's this nonsense? <clears throat> So she was born on May 31st, 1912, raised in a small fishing town just north of Shanghai, China. Although relatively uncommon for girls to attend uh, school, she went to Mingdei Women's Vocational Continuing School. It was founded by her father, which is probably why she got to get uh, get into it, who believed yeah. that all girls should receive an, uh, an education. So she had a based dad. Um, in 1934, Xian Xiong uh, graduated at the top of her class with a degree in physics from the National Central University in Nanking, China. And after she graduated, she worked in a physics lab in China. Her mentor was Dr. Jing Wei Gu, um, another woman working in the field of physics. So she encouraged Xin Xiong to continue her education in the United States, and she got into the uh, University of Berkeley, pretty prestigious university. Oh, yeah. Uh, in 1942, she married Luke Xialu Yuan, who she had met uh, during her studies at Berkeley, they moved to the East Coast where Dr. Wu uh, taught physics at Smith College in Northampton. So a a pair of smart uh, people here. Um, Shortly afterwards, in 1944, Dr. Wu took a job at Columbia University in New York City and was... Oh, TJ, did did you do some math? You like equations, eh? Yeah. All right, here you go. I don't know because you, you can't really see it. No, nope. it. Dude. You suck, Damn. CJ. You're a equa- you didn't. You just showed me a blank, blank page. Sheet of- yeah, 
That's too fucking bright. I gotta fucking darken it up. TJ trying to fucking cheat. Um, so she some of some of the things that she was involved in. She was involved in the Manhattan Project. Let's put it that way. Oh fuck, dude. Yeah. Um, so of course we're working towards the creation of the atomic bomb. Uh, Chien Xiong's what was that? Wow, TJ. I think you need to check your fucking math again. You need to check your math again, TJ. Hold, do, right, do me a favor. On. Put hold up two fingers on your hand here, like this, and then hold up two right. fingers on your other hand, like this. No, wrong, wrong. Two on the other hand. Two. Like this, TJ. Like Richard Nixon, dude. <laughs> I give it up. Yeah, peace. Uh, I am not yeah. a crook. Two, three, seven, seven. Okay, you got it, okay, TJ. TJ. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, Wait, hold on. I have to check some integers. Yeah, please do. <laughs> right. Um, Chien Xiong's research uh, included improving Geiger counters for the detection of radiation and the enrich- enrichment of uranium in large quantities. Um, Enrico Fermi, the architect of the uh, atomic bomb, had published his theory of beta decay in 1934. Uh, and that's interesting because, like, if he had just waited a little longer, he could have watched TJ from age 20 to 30 and seen, like, you know, a live example of beta decay, but, um, Oh yeah. <laughs> hey, I proved that. See, I guess you can't see that too good. But, I know. Um, can't see that too good either. TJ. You really, there you go. okay. I see. Yeah. Yeah. E yeah, plus yeah, squiggle equals line yeah. equals line. Yeah. 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 I checked my math and, uh, two plus two firmly seven. Yep. Okay. Well, she just in the proof. So there you go. So this bitch is stupid compared to me. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> of course, you got her. You got her beat, TJ. I can, beat I can fucking build. I don't need to go to Berkeley to build no nuclear reactor bullshit. I just fucking throw that shit together. No of problem. Course. Slap it all together, TJ, with some yeah. fucking duct tape. Slap dash. Um. So anyway, the theory of beta decay, uh, you know, by Enrico Fermi, but a following experiment from another physicist uh, suggested variance in Fermi's findings. <laughs> As a result, Wu decided to repeat the experiment, and her findings displayed the first documented confirmation of Fermi's theory of beta decay. So she basically (laughs) peeked in and watched TJ's career through a time portal. Yeah, she's like, ah, yes, uh, proven the beta. His career decays as it goes on. (laughs) Beta decay, dude. Beta decay. Oh, man, too good. You could also fucking be like, uh, do like a fucking pussy version of Donkey Kong. Be like, show DK, and then you show like a wimpy, scrawny one. It's like Beta DK, you know? Uh, Get it? Uh, I think it's funny. Fuck you. You just don't. You don't appreciate puns, Paul. Man, you just hate, like, yeah, look, look, Paul. You hate puns. <laughs> hate puns. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. You like puns. fucking Donkey Kong. You know what I mean? And you put it like a weak one. It's, it's the beta. It's beta the beta DK. Beta DK, man. You don't get it, do you? No, you I, get it. I get it. I get it. You get it, dude. Yeah. DK, yeah. Yeah, yeah. DK. Um, so, in the mid-50s, Wu was approached by two theoretical physicists, uh, Sung Dao Li and Chen Ning Yang. I don't know why all these people are Asian. Why are all these theoretical physicists that know everything about the way the universe works? Do you know, uh, do you know uh, Manson's Asian name, dude? What is it? Chin Too Fat. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, okay. They wanted help disproving the law of conservation of parity, which stated that two mirror phys- uh, mirrored physical systems such as atoms behave in identical ways and do not differentiate between left and right. So using the chemical isotope cobalt 60, she showed that the laws of nature were not always symmetrical, disproving the law that had been ex- uh, accepted for more than 30 years. I, I disagree. Uh, well, you all can right, disagree all you want. All right. I'm not Unfor- gonna fucking Unfortunately, although this led to a Nobel Prize for Yang and Lee in 1957, she was excluded, as were many other female scientists during this time. Um, so yeah. everybody she worked with got a Nobel I'm Prize. Flashing but they were back like- to the time I was watching a stand-up special with uh, Joe Rogan, and he was just like, um, <laughs> "You look at the female inventor page; there's nothing there. It's like women just don't invent things, bro." Yeah. Like, mm. They've kind of just been like erased and scrubbed away pretty much or just ignored. Well, bro, we did a really great job on that project. Well, bro, good, good, good job, Chen Xing Wu. You fucking made it. But uh, Nobel Prize is mine. Yeah, bitch. Wu, I'm really sorry, Wu. But, uh, you know, turns out I'm the brilliant one. Holy shit. I just fucking 
The dude fucking, uh, what's that fucking asshole's name that stole credit for every invention under the sun? Thomas Edison. She yeah. fucking Thomas Edison'd him. Her. Uh, pretty hey, much. Hey, Thomas Edison, her. Look, bro, real sorry about this, but uh, look, I mean, men only. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you're free to do the work, but uh, the credit. The credit, you know where that goes. <laughs> that belongs to me. Yeah. So Wu was aware, of course, of the gender-based injustice, and at an MIT symposium, she stated, uh, I wonder whether the tiny atoms and nuclei or the mathematical symbols or the DNA molecules have any preference for either masculine or feminine treatment. Oh, yeah, they do prefer masculine treatment. (laughs) Yeah, it's just a a fact, clearly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Chin Chiang Wu uh, continued to be a leader in the field of physics. Uh, Her work even crossed over to biology and medicine. Some of her research included looking at the molecular changes in red blood cells that cause sickle cell disease. Uh, Although denied recognition with the Nobel Prize, Dr. Wu received many honors in her career. Um, She's only the seventh woman elected to the National Academy of Sciences. And this was back in 1958. Um, The Comstock Prize in Physics given by the National Academy of Sciences, the first woman uh, to be president of the American Physical Society, and the first person to receive the Wolf Prize in Physics, and I'm sure these are all very prestigious. I don't happen to know. But, I mean, and, and, I, and the, in the field of physics, I'm oh, sure. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm sure people who are, are, know physics shit better than us are like, damn. I'm sure any <laughs> one of these is considered to be a pretty high honor. And she's, you know, got tons of them. She was the first honorary doctorate awarded at uh, Princeton to a woman. And in 1990, she had an asteroid named after her. It's uh, 2752 Wu Xiansheng. You, uh, you know what's really crazy to me about these episodes is that not only do people not know about them, but if these people had not been given the opportunities to work in these fields, like how drastically different society would be. Yeah. I mean, really insane. I mean, and like, I mean, how many people? Were, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, you take any of these people out of the their place and time and we might be living in a totally different world. You know what I mean? Um, or yeah, under, I can't do what she does. I don't have that mind. You know, very few people are just truly that gifted and determined to do this stuff. And it's unfortunate that just because of her gender. But and have race, you heard of Thomas Jefferson? Yeah, yeah, I have <laughs> actually. You, you know what? You know what's great about her? I don't hear. I don't remember any of the part of the story being told about her life where she rapes somebody. So <laughs> that, that's that, true. That's a positive. She wasn't a kid sniffer either. Um, she yeah. died in 1997 at the ripe old age of 84. So she lived a nice full life and accomplished more than you know the next ten people will. So there's some amazing Asians for you. Amazians. Um, I'm trying to figure out uh, a way to do this for every race, and I'm really stymied by how I'm going to do this for black people. Bodacious blacks or some shit. I don't oh. know if that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's some work. Yeah. Bodacious I'm, blacks. I want to workshop that one just a little more. Yeah, I'm going to call this one Bodacious Blacks. Yep. See what they think about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, see you next time. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's your old pal Mickey here with a direct order. I mean, an option that you are strongly encouraged to take advantage of. You will click the link below. You will subscribe to the Pessimist Productions Patreon. I mean, (laughs) if you want to wink, wink, there's more content there than, well, you could swing a dead toddler at exclusive shows, exclusive streams, hours of exclusive content. Why aren't you clicking? Why aren't you subscribing to the Pessimist Productions Patreon? <laughs> You're making Mickey sad. Yeah,